this beautiful lady standing over here with me. Amen. She's sitting over here. Good thing. Okay, I wish she'd hurry up and let me go sit down. Amen. Um, obviously, when we go to uh, on a Holy Land pilgrimage like we went on, you can't come back to uh, your church and not talk about that when you get home. So that's exactly what uh, we're going to do today and what I'm going to do today in the message. And, uh, but first... I have a special treat for you. I have asked my wife to come and to tell you about her experience and what, just what she felt or what she uh, gleaned from her time in the Holy Land. Would you give Sister Sharp a hand as she comes at this time? You got a mic. Let me get you. Well, I gleaned that I will not do another 12 hour and 40 minute flight. <laughs> at least and not in economy and so every time I fly those seats get smaller I have less leg room okay and uh, when I sit by brother sharp I have less shoulder room <laughs> and so uh, but um uh, it we truly enjoyed ourselves we've been doing a small group for the last 12 days with 16 other, with six, 14 other people. And um, uh, we went to, um, let's see, we got to uh, Tiberias, uh, which is by the uh, Sea of Galilee, which is really a lake, okay? And um, then we got to go to Jerusalem and uh, see quite a bit there. And I've been one other time, and I was very young. And so I remember some things, and it seemed easier last time, okay. You know, we did an average of uh, five to eight miles most days, and uh, some days we did as many as 16 flights of stairs. 16. There's a lot of stairs in Jerusalem. A lot of stairs in Jerusalem and in Rome and so but um, we had a guy that um, had had some insight um, as a Jew and um, there were a few things that he said and one of the things um, and I am convinced okay that my phone listens to things all not just me but things around me because um, after he said this, I seen it the same thing on Facebook. You know, that's a little creepy, people. But anyway, um, the Bible was written with no punctuation. No punctuation. And think about that for a minute. And so, um, a comma is an important thing. It's a little bitty thing. But it's very important. And um, you have the sentence, okay, let's go eat, Grandma. Now, we can go eat, Grandma, or we can go eat, Grandma. Let's go, Grandma. And so, depending on how you read that, along with understanding that... Um, when, when all of those things were written, and um, there's no punctuation, but their customs and their knowledge, okay, is what is there. And we can't, we have to understand more than just our world today to understand what God wants for us. And... Uh, um, there is there is so much that we apply to ourselves as we want it to be because we put the comma in a different place and that's not what God intended and I, I pray one of my prayers of late is Lord let me know where that comma should be in my life where is the comma in this situation what am I to see and understand and so um, I don't know it's one of the first things that he said and and I 
all week, all, uh, or 10, 12, however many days <laughs> it's been. And so we lose track of time. But that's what I want. I, I want to see that. And I want to every day remember, okay, that where does God want the comma in my life? How does he want me to see it and understand it? Do I want to just apply it the way that I want to? Or do I want to apply it the way he wants it applied? Please. Make sure you turn it off. Praise the Lord. Now I have nothing to preach at all. No, I'm picking. I'm picking. But that was awesome. Uh, and the Bible tells us, and to, to add on to Sister Sharp's sermon this morning, uh, I'm going to get in trouble for that in a minute. Um, the Bible tells us to seek out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Our guide was a, a Judaizer. He was a Jew of, of the tribe of Judah in particular, and he was third generation Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem, so he was very proud of that fact. And he told us, and we had quite, quite a few great conversations, he told us, he said, you find two Jews, you find three opinions. The reason why is the comma business. And he said, you, you, you go to each, this synagogue and they, they, they say it this way. And you go to this synagogue and they say it this way. And he said, throughout this town you'll find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rabbis arguing about where the comma goes. And I thought, man, that sounds familiar. And it's, it's bad enough to try to figure out where your comma goes then you start trying to figure out where somebody else's comma goes. Oh, come on now. I'm already preaching. I, I, I'm, I'm, y'all, y'all, since Starp, you started this. I, you probably have messed up my next Sunday sermon because that's exactly where I was going to go to the comma sermon. But that's all right. Amen. That's all right. I mean it. You, you're in the will of God. And so you have a hard enough time trying to figure out where the comma goes in your life. And that word of God, reading that word of God, not only reading it but understanding it and take it to heart with with faith and fear and understanding that your eternal salvation and security is based on how you hear and receive the word of the god the word of the lord and and the unique thing is is that the word of the lord is not changed that book is there and it's been there those first five books have been there for thousands and thousands of years and then the new testament came along two thousand years ago and it has not changed so it's your responsibility to read it, pray about it, hear it, amen, and test it, and, and see. And so today, we're going we're gonna to do, I'm going to give you the opportunity, you're going to have homework when you leave here today, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about the pilgrimage that my wife and I went on, and what I saw, and what I discovered there. Simply, I told them that this morning, the title of my sermon is What I Know. And, and that's what I know from visiting the Holy Land and what I have discovered. And so that's what I'm going to do today. But I'm not going to turn this into a Bible study because Bible studies are done on Wednesday night around here. I, I, I do want to uh, talk to you about the Scripture. But it's going to be up to you to go home, take out your Bible, open it up and say, I'm going to see a pastor, listen to me, put the comma in the right place. It's my job to preach it. But you better go home and test it. You better prove every word that is spoken in a pulpit. Whether I speak it, Brother Calk, somebody else comes here and speaks it. Don't just stand into a church, go to a church and listen to the man that's preaching without trying to figure out where the comma goes. It means you've got to take the book out and, 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 and you've got to study it and you've got to know it. And if you need a little help, we've got some folks that can help you with that, that can open the Word and help you to understand it. But you need to start your journey because you're going to answer to God for where you put the comma in your life. Thank you, Sister Sharp, for saying that. Amen. Give her another hand. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Foster. Amen. I appreciate your, your spirit and, and the spirit of this praise team today. I'm going to just go on into speaking, and so you can be dismissed. Amen. Um, as I've already said, today you're going to have homework when I'm through. You need to go home and Google what I'm saying to you. You need to go home and search it in the Bible and, and figure it out for yourself uh, if the comma's in the right place and what Pastor Sharp said. But 
After my pilgrimage to the Holy Land, there are three things. Everybody say three things. Three things that I know. And this is what the, those three things are. It is there, them, and us. Say it with me. There, them, and us. And I can preach as fast as you can listen. And I probably need to preach real fast because jet lag is going to hit me about a little, in a little bit and you never know when it hits you. And if you have never traveled intercontinentally, you don't know about jet lag, but it is real. It is literally like flipping the light switch on your life and you, you can't stay awake if you want to. So if I fall asleep in this sermon, y'all just drag me out to my car and let somebody drive me home. But I'm going to preach as fast as you can listen or talk to you as fast as I, you, you can listen about their, them, and us. The first thing that I know is that he was there. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about, is that he was there. When I speak of he, I'm speaking of Jesus. Jesus was a man that lived in the Holy Land. He was a man that was born in Nazareth, Bethlehem, came and was raised in Nazareth, did his ministry around the Sea of Galilee, and spent his last ten days of his life in Jerusalem, was crucified outside of the city's wall, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose from the grave. He was there. There is undeniable evidence both biblically and in extra-biblical text and historically that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, was there. Even the agnostics have to admit that the man was there. And while he was there, while he was on the earth, and while he preached for three and a half years the doctrine that he had, and as he began to, and this is the part that Sister Sharp was talking about, as he began to place the comma, he would say, you have heard it said, comma. He said, but I say unto you, and he changed the comma. You have done this, but let me tell you what it supposed to have been like you I've told you this is a house of prayer but you've made it a den of thieves I, I you have said uh, that when uh, you should kill your enemy I have said unto you feed your enemy he began to preach a different doctrine he began to tell the rabbis of his days you have gotten it wrong and the worst thing is, is he started doing that at 12 years old. At 12 years old, he began to ask and answer questions that no one else had asked or answered. He began to speak, and those other rabbis began to be amazed at him. And he was there. And while he was there, his doctrine or his teachings changed the world. We were privileged to end up our trip in Rome. And Jesus never went to Rome. Jesus never saw what Sister Sharp and I saw 2,000 years later. But much, or a lot, not much, but a lot of the Roman Empire ruins still exist. After 2,000 years, the walls of the city of Rome still stand. We went in and out of gates every single day that people have been going in and out of and doors have been opening and closing on city walls and city gates for 2,000 years. It was the, it, uh, if you've never seen the ancient world and the Roman world, then you don't understand it and it will amaze you if you ever see it. And it was so powerful, so massive. From there, our plane uh, was diverted to Constantinople, and we, we, we went through there going, but we stayed there on the way back. And Constantinople used to be called uh, Const, uh, um, Istanbul. Yeah, it was, we went to Istanbul. It used to be called Constantinople. That's why I couldn't get it right. We went to Istanbul, which is a headquarters of, of, of a Muslim, or the, the, the Moors and, and, and the Ottoman Empire is there. But before that, the Roman uh, uh, emperor who converted to Christianity named Constantine moved his capital to there. So now we have this Roman Empire that is stretched all over the known world. And one Jewish man from nowhere called Nazareth brought it all down. Because of his teachings, the most 
strong and unbelievable empire that had ever been built by humanity that had coliseums and races. They had uh, uh, the, the Circus Maximus is where the chariot races. We all talk about the Colosseum where the gladiators fall. That would only seat about 60,000, some 100,000 people. But the Circus Maximus where the horse races were at would seat 250,000 people every race, a quarter of a million people. It is mind-blowing to see the ruins in Rome and to think that one man from Nazareth <laughs> that never visited Rome, never went to Constantinople, never had an army, oh, listen to me, and never struck a sword, amen, that one man by what he taught and where he placed the comma and what he had to say changed the face of humanity. What I want to tell you is he was there. The second thing about there is I want to tell you he's not there now. Now we visited a tomb that's owned by some British people and, 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 and a British organization, great group of people, it's a very lovely setting. There's another place they think was the tomb of Jesus, the crucifixion tomb of Jesus in the inner city held by the Orthodox Church. You can be quite sure that neither one of those locations are correct. Both of those people are very sincere and both those people are making a lot of money from you and I going to see those kind of things. And you can walk into the barred tomb and you can look around and see it, but you can rest assured that was not the tomb. It does give you some sort of illustration of what a tomb looked like. And some people kind of get carried away and kiss the ground and all that other kind of stuff. But you've got to understand the tomb that Jesus was buried in is about 20 feet below the earth because the city's been built up over the 2,000 years. And so, uh, yes, you can go into this place and you can come out and think he's not there. But I can tell you without ever going, he's not there. I can tell, how can you tell me he's not there? Because I believe in faith, what his word said. That he was in that barred tomb for only three days, and on the third day, he rose from the grave. I believe that in faith. I don't need to get on an airplane, fly for 12 hours and 40 minutes to the other side of the world, see a tomb that somebody's costing coin for you to go into. I don't need to see that to tell you he is not in Jerusalem. His temple is not there. If you see pictures that we produce on Facebook in the next few days, and you'll see a beautiful golden dome on the top of Temple Mound, that is not a Jewish temple. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. It is a Muslim mosque. There is no Jewish temple. So if you're going to sacrifice and celebrate the five feasts or the three feasts or whatever feast of the Jewish holiday, I can tell you he's not in Jerusalem. There is no temple, there is no holiest of holies, there is no blood sacrifice, he's not there. As a matter of fact, the Muslims are where he is supposed to be. He's not there. You do not feel any more of God on the temple mound than you felt in this service today. I'm telling you what I know from where I've been. I know he was there, and I know he's not there. I'm going to tell you the third thing about there. I told you there's three things I want to talk to you about. There, them, and us. And then we'll go home. The third thing about there is he will return there. He's not there. He was there. He's not there. But he will be back. I can tell you of a certainty he will be back. My wife and I stood on the Mount of Ascension at the top of Mount Olive, Olive it, where the olive trees grow, and at the bottom is the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of the olive press. We stood on top of that mountain where his disciples stood with him after his death, where he had taught them for 40 days, and there on that Mount of Ascension, it's in your Bible, he began to rise up in the sky. And as he before he went, he said this, he said, uh, 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 well, let me just read what the book of Acts says. Until the day which he was taken up, up after that through many holy, uh, excuse me, through the Holy Ghost had given commandments to the apostles which he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive by his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not 
depart from Jerusalem, but they should wait, oh, I feel preach coming on now, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard me preach to you. For John truly baptized with water, but you, uh, if you will do what I tell you and you will wait in faith, uh, shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost uh, not many days henceforth. And when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you tell me uh, this, uh, what time thou will restore the kingdom to Israel? They were caught up with there, with there. What are you going to do for me now? What are you, are you going to set up your kingdom now? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times nor the season which your father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things on that mountain where you and I stood, Sister Sharp, amen, while he spoke these things, uh, they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked up steadfastly, towards the heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Hey, guys from Galilee, why stand you looking in the air? Didn't you hear what he said to you? You better go down to Jerusalem, back to that upper room and tarry. He said, for this same Jesus, he was there, he's not there, but he's coming back there. For this same Jesus, which was taken up from you unto heaven, shall so come again, come in like manner, as ye have seen him go unto the heavens. I'm telling you that he is coming back there. Now, if you've got time for a Bible study, come Wednesday night. When he comes back there, to the same mountain that he left from there, when he comes back there, he's not coming back alone. Come Wednesday night and you'll find out who he comes. I'll tell you who he comes. He comes back with the saints of God there to those people who have rejected him there. To the people he came to first, to them that he came to first and that rejected him. And when he comes back there, he's coming back with a white robe thrown to overthrow the power in the earth. Uh, and oh, somebody help me now. And to claim that which is own. First thing we talked about is them. Excuse me, is there. The second thing I want to talk to you about is them. He loved them. He was one of them. If you're African American, you identify with African Americans. If you're African, Sister Alice, you identify with Africans. If you're Latino, you identify with Latinos. If you're Anglo, you identify with white folks. Jesus was a Jew. And he identified with them. The food was great that we had over there for two days. And then we realized we had to be there 15. I got olive oil dripping out of my pores like you can't imagine. I'm telling you, I, I, I love olives. I could eat them by the pound, but I don't want to see one for six years. I don't want a French fry uh, 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 fried in olive oil. I didn't think you could run a French fry. But my God, you put it in olive oil, it tastes horrible. I mean, I couldn't even finish them. Amen. But he loved olive oil, evidently, because they love olive oil. He identified with them. They were his own. They were his people. And he came to his people. But his people didn't receive him. How and why did he pick them? He picked them because of Abraham's obedience to the voice of a God he had never seen. Oh, help me now. I'm talking about them. He loved them. Three things. There, them, and us. He loved them. Why did he love them? Why did he pick them? Because of Abraham's obedience. Abraham heard a voice of God. He listened by faith to the voice of God. And he sojourned and he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. And because of that, he picked 
the children of Israel. They became his chosen people. That's who he chose to come through. He picked them. He loved them. He picked them. Now, he did not pick them for what they were. But he picked them for what they were not. We preach in a Judeo-Christian society about the Jewish church and Judaism and, and, and worship and the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And we talk about it all the time because that's what we are, a Judeo-Christian church. We are a Christian church that finds our roots in De Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. That is where we find our root. And we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just as they do. And so we talk about these people a lot. But these people were not very big. They were not very famous. And only at one period in time of history, of their whole history, where they kind of on the top of the food chain. And that was when David was there. And they didn't stay there long. As soon as Solomon came, he found a way to blow it. And so they went to the bottom again. The children of Israel is a small nation. It is so small that the Egyptians, which probably Hebrew slaves built part of the pyramids and those things that you see in Egypt, they didn't even make the hieroglyphics. They didn't make the news. They weren't famous. They weren't important. There weren't a lot of them. Now, the Babylonians, they made the news. The Assyrians, they made the news. The Egyptians, they made the news. But when you look through the hieroglyphics of history, you can't even find the Hebrew people. Very difficult. They're not named, they're not important, they're not, they were just a people that were absolutely at the wrong place at the wrong time. They were in the crossroads of humanity. It was where east met west. And every time there was a war, every time there was a push from the east uh, to the west, they got trampled and they got overthrown very quickly, usually. Most times they just surrendered. Because they had seen it before. They had seen this movie before. So they just gave up. And they just adapted whatever somebody told them. And they just said, we'll wait it out till the next bunch overthrows them. And whether they're in Babylon or they're in Syria or they're overthrown by the Egyptians or they're carried off here or there, they're just wrong place at wrong time kind of people. So he does not pick them because they are important. He does not pick them because they are perfect. He does not pick them because they are wealthy. I'm preaching to some of you right now. I'm trying to give you hope. Because when he looks at us, where I'm going to in a moment, I'm sorry, i got to pick up the last part so I don't lose some of you right now. Amen. When he looks at us, he looks at us the same way he looked at them. They're not the smartest. They're not the best. Uh, they're not the brightest. Uh, they're not that big. They're not that that. But I pick them. He picked them, not because of what they were, because of what they were not. They were small, they were unknown, and they were a beat-down people. He revealed himself to them through them. He comes as a Jew to the Jews. Now, he, I'm not talking about any old he. I'm not just talking about a capital H he. I'm talking about capital H-E he. The He of all heaven. The He of the beginning. The He who was Alpha and Omega. The He who was first and last. The He who spoke the worlds into existence. Uh, and He, and He said, I'm going to come like them and I'm going to reveal myself to them uh, and I'm going to bring my power through them. Oh, you, I hope you get this. The there, the them. And it's gonna, we're going to end up with the us. He came to them like them. It was like, matter of fact, some of them saw him and they said, who is this from Nazareth? We know his brothers. That's just Joseph the carpenter's son. And he had no honor among his own people. Can you imagine the prophecies of Isaiah being produced in your presence and here, Emmanuel, God in the flesh, is walking among you and all you see is a carpenter? All you see is a commoner. All you see is somebody else. I want you to look over at somebody beside you and go, Oh my, you got he in you. 
Oh, I'm taking you to the end of my message. Amen. When you look at that person beside you, you are, you are not just looking at another Jewish brother, another Pentecostal sister, another believer. You are looking at He. The Bible said when we receive Him through faith and are filled with His power and His Spirit, we become the body of Christ. We're not just anybody. We're somebody. Hmm. He was the Christ. He was the Christ. He came to his own because he said it. Because he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Because when he told Philip, when you have seen me, my God, I feel my helper hitting me now. When you look at me, you have seen the Father. How is it that you ask me to see the Father? Have I been so long with you and you don't know me? Ah, oh, he came to his own. And I wonder how many of you come into an apostolic, Holy Ghost filled service like you are in today and don't know whose presence you're in. My, 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 my. Not only did he come to his own, he revealed himself to his own. What do you need to see? You need water in the wine? Got that. What do you need to see? Ha, 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 ha. Hallelujah. What do you need to see? You need to see a dead boy raised to life? What do you need to see? You need to see blind eyes open? Is it, what do you need to see? If you need to see the leprous man healed, then let it be. I'm going to heal him. I'm going to spit on the ground. I'm going to create another eyeball out of mud. I'm going to stick it in somebody's eye and suck it and say, now go and wash yourself because you, I'm trying to reveal myself to you. I would ask some of us, what do you need to see? <laughs> what do you need to see? He came to his own. He said, I'm here. Our prophets have said I'm here. John, the greatest prophet of all, saw me walking down the road, fell down, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the earth. John, who was the baptizer, the immerser, the washer of men's sins, uh, the preacher from the wilderness, that John who gave his head for the gospel, that John saw him coming, and Jesus said, you got to baptize me. Oh, no, I don't. He said, there's nothing, you have no need to be washed, for you're already clean. And Jesus said, oh no, you got to baptize me to fulfill what is spoken, so that, that those that come after me will know that if I had to be baptized, wherein baptism doth now save us, then you got to be baptized. He revealed himself to them. He did not come and destroy the law. He did not come and undo the law, but he came and fulfilled the law. What do you need to see? He produced himself to them. They had been prophesying about his coming, but yet they received him not. Some of you have been going from church to church to church. I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost. Some of you have been wondering why your marriage, your first one didn't work, your second one didn't work, your money's not working, your mind's not working. Some of you are trying to figure it out, and you're looking for something. That's staring you right in the face. Uh, and that he is trying to reveal himself to you. And that last week of his life when he eclipsed that beautiful mountain of ascension. That Mount of Olives where we stood, Sheila. I showed you what he saw. We stood there on that mountaintop, looked across the valley of Kidron and the brook Kidron there, and on the other side there's that golden mosque, but in those days that mosque is only a third the size that the temple of the Lord was. And it stood stories and stories, 170 feet in the air, beautiful limestone covered in gold, and gorgeous sight as the eastern sun begins to, the sun begins to rise out of the east and strikes that building. And Jesus looks over... That 
that city that he loved. He looked over that place that he was there. And he looked over the people that were his people. And he said, how oft I would have gathered you together. How oft I would have saved your marriage. How oft I would have saved your money. How oft I would have saved your mind. But you would not. Came to his own. He came to them. And they didn't want him. He didn't come from the right place. He didn't come the way they thought. Well, you Pentecostals are a little wild and crazy. I, I was raised a different persuasion. I, we're a little quieter in church. Uh, we do a little of this or that. He doesn't come the way you. Mm. He doesn't come the way. I'm going to say it. If, if we don't do church the way you do church, you do the same thing to us as you did to him. You crucify. He didn't come from where they thought he would. Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. His doctrine had commas in different places. Blew people's mind. He said, what you've been saying and what they've been doing for years has been wrong. For 1,500 years have been wrong. And he said, I've called this a house of prayer. For, and, and for the zeal of his father's house, the Bible said, you got homework, go, go search that scripture. For the zeal of his father's house, he wove a cord together. We walked on the place where he wove the cord. We crossed the valley that he crossed while he was looking at that city. And with that woven whip that he wove with his own hands, he began to kick tables over and began to run them out of that place. And he said, this is supposed to be a church. This is supposed to be where the Shekinah of God moves. This is supposed to be where the power of God exists. But you made it something it's not. You put the comma in the wrong place. You made it something it's not. And he drove them out of his father's house. I talked to you about there. He was there. I talked to you about them. He came to his own. And finally, the third thing and in closing I want to talk to you is about us. He loved them and he loves us. I preached the Sunday before I left to go on this pilgrimage with my wife and these other people that we went with. I preached to you uh, if they had only knew. How many people remember the message of the Samaritan woman? How many people remember that? Amen. I preached to you that Sunday. If you were not here that Sunday, all you need to do is go and click on our YouTube page or go and click on our Facebook page and find the sermon if they only knew. If they only knew who it was. And I used the story and the account that Jesus... Uh, spoke to his disciples. And, and, and I listened carefully, Sister Sharp, to our Jewish guide. And by his own admission, he was a backslidden Jewish guy. He said, I, I'm, a, I'm a Jewish guy. I'm, I'm, I'm of the tribe of Judah. I, I know about Shabbat, and I know about this and that. And so somebody asked him, well, why aren't you keeping Shabbat? And why aren't you doing what all the other Jews are doing on the Sabbath, which starts at 6 p.m. on Friday night? Why are you still with us? And he goes, well... I'm not a practicing Jew. I'm, I'm, I'm a backslidden Jew. I, I'm a secular Jew. I listen carefully as we pass through that area where Jesus made the pilgrimage from Galilee to Jerusalem for the Passover that he was going to be the Paschal Lamb for, that he would become the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world for. And I listened to see what he would say. I wanted to ask... But I carefully listened instead. And as we begin to pass through certain places, and we pass through Jericho, and we pass through certain places, and someone said, and it, it, uh, it was this is how Jesus would have come to, uh, um, uh, to the city of Jerusalem. And we passed through those places, and, and they said, is this how Jesus would have come through Jerusalem? He said, no! Jesus would have never gone to Jerusalem this way. As a matter of fact, he said, you tell a story in your New Testament about a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You know the story of the Good Samaritan and he was beaten on the roadside. He said, only a fool would make that journey. And if you've never made it, you don't understand it. 
You've got Jerusalem, which is on top of the mountains, 300 and something feet in the air. And you've got Jericho, which is below sea level, about 1,200 feet below sea level in a 20-mile traverse. Literally, you go down these treacherous hills. It is the most dangerous passage. Even to this day, you don't want to have a blowout or you don't want to have problems because there's thieves and bandits that live in those hills. He said, Jesus would have never taken this journey from, Jer from uh, Galilee to Jerusalem. There are two ways he would have never gone. He would have never gone this way, and then he said it. And he would have never gone through Samaria because the Samaritans were filthy dogs. They were people that were not a people. And when they went to Jerusalem, they never took this path or never took that path. But the Sunday before I left, I preached to you. Jesus told his disciples, we need to go through Samaria. Don't you know it blew their mind? Because he had told them earlier in his ministry, don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go into their cities. But on the way to the sacrifice and on the way to the crucifixion, he said, I came to my own and my own received me not. I came to them, but they didn't receive me. So I'm coming to us. Somebody say us. I'm coming to a people who are not a people who are outside. I've got to go. I've got to go. I can tell you this. He loves us. Can I tell you, Danielle? He loves you. Jesus, I feel this in my spirit. I want to rebuke hell openly by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't care what the devil ever tells you. And I don't care what you've ever done or what you will ever do. Jesus loves you. Somebody in this place, this is not in my notes. I'm feeling the spirit of prophecy and the, the gift of spirits working in me right now. Somebody in this place, the devil's been lying to you and telling you he doesn't love you because of what you've done. I want to tell you, before you ever knew him, he came looking for you. Before you knew his name, before you knew which mountain to worship in, before you knew which way was up or down, he said, I got to go. I got to get Cresha. I got to go. I got to get Carolyn. I, I got to go. I got to find Dot. I, I got to find you. I got to find Steve. Steve, I, I got to find Kirby. When your mom and your daddy didn't care about you, your boss didn't care about you, the government didn't care about you, he said, I got to go. God have mercy. God have mercy right now. Lift your hands and understand that he loves you. He picked you. He picked us. There's three things I know. He was there. He came to them. But he's come to us. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, I'm preaching to you what I know. He loves us. He came looking for us in our Samaritan situation. He came looking for us in our Samaritan situation. How many husbands? How many this? How many that? How much backsliding? How much sin? Uh, how dirty? How filthy? How, how much false God? False doctrine? Oh, we worship like this. Uh, how much oh, false religion? How many was caught in false religion? A, go a, a gospel that was not a gospel? And he came and he said, I got to come to you because I love you. <laughs> you said, well, I got a relationship with God. I love people like you. I love people. I, I'm, I'm trying to resist because my wife's here and I feel the spirit of my wife pressing on this side of my body right now. Uh, but uh, some, uh, I, I'm being facetious right now. Uh, some of you crack me up. Hey, man, you got the me and Jesus. Uh, me and JC got our own thing going. So she don't like that move. And now I just did it online. Now I'm really in trouble. Hey, Amen. Me and JC got our own thing going. I got my own understanding of God. I worship in this mountain. You worship in that mountain. This is how I see God. And that's how you see God. And we're all cool. And Jesus looked into the face of that Samaritan woman. And he said, if you knew. 
If you knew the service you're sitting in today, if you knew the presence of God you were in the midst of today, if you knew that the Creator that spoke heaven and earth was in existence in here, and if you really believed it, what would your faith be like? Uh, if you, my God, I'm not going to preach over the point. You can stand there and look like I didn't say something powerful if you want to. But you need to understand the one that said, let there be light, spoke. And he is here today by his Holy Spirit. That same God. And if you really believed it, you would act like it. Fear and confusion come on your face and problems and sorrow and sickness come into your Samaritan situation. But if you really knew who it was uh, who's speaking to you, who you feel in this house, uh, oh, He loved us. He came looking for us uh, at a Samaritan well. Uh, he came looking for who? Say us. Who is us? Us is true worshipers. Because in one sermon at the Samaritan well, he rebukes both the Samaritan and the Jews. He said, woman, you worship in this mountain. And the Jews worship in Jerusalem, that mountain. He said, you don't have a clue what you're doing. You don't even know who it is that you're worshiping. Listen. <laughs> It seems that his arrogance had overtaken the circumstance or the situation. But what he was being, what he was taking authority over was religion in general. Not Samaritan religion. He said, you don't even know who you worship in that mountain. Because if you did, you would know who's talking to you. And he said, and the Jews say that mountain. And they know who it is they worship. Because Isaiah and John and all the prophets said the Messiah is coming and I am He. He would tell her that in a few moments. You got homework. You better go check and see if I'm putting a comma in the right place. You better go see, prove my words through your gospel. And through your Bible. Take, don't, don't tell what grandma said and grandpa said and your former organization and LMNOP and this. Uh, the organ. I don't care what initials you put on a church. Uh, you better open that leather bound book uh, and you better see where the commas are at. Uh, you better understand what Jesus was trying to say. He said, that ain't right. But this ain't right either. Yes, they know what they're doing in Jerusalem. But they don't even know who I am. I picked them. I was the fourth man in the fire. I was the visitor at Abraham's tent. I was the voice in the burning bush. I was the angel of the Lord. I was the salvation of the host. I was the captain of the host of the army of Israel. And they don't know me. I've been in their mountain and they didn't recognize me. Uh, he said, the time is coming. Uh -huh. It's coming uh, where you'll neither worship in this mountain nor in that mountain. He said, the time is coming. Whoa! And now is. He made that statement 2,000 years ago. And now is. Uh, that true worshipers. Somebody say, he comes looking for me. Is there a true worshiper in this house right now? Is there a true worshiper that doesn't care who it is in the pulpit? Uh, that doesn't care what initials are on the door? That doesn't care what your heritage or your history is? Is there a true worshiper in this place right now that just loves God with all your heart, soul, mind? That's it. All your heart, soul, that's it. With all your heart. Is there a true worshiper? Because he is seeking such. Uh, he is seeking such uh, to worship him in spirit uh, and in truth. Oh, right now, when a true worshiper begin to worship your God like you were alone with Him in His presence uh, and nobody else was around, is there a true worshiper who said, I'll reject my mountain, uh, I'll reject this, uh, I'll reject that, but I'll receive Christ. Oh, right now, worshipers, tap in, tap in, tap in, tap in. The Holy Ghost uh, is trying to do something.
Mama Haki Andoyata, Hialabaha. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Sister Sharp, walk over here. Amen. Right behind Sister Mary, our African sister. Amen. Right now. I don't care what culture you came from, what continent you came from. I don't care what hill you worshiped in. I'm preaching to you that the God, the God that is a spirit, the eternal spirit, is in this house. Allah Lay hands on her, Sister Sharp. God's doing something right now. Lay hands on her right now. He Allah Baha. He call Allah Bo Shadaha. He Allah Baha. Shamana Allah Bo Koha. He Allah Bo Shata Allah Bo Hori Andaha. Allah Bo Shata. If you knew who it was, sister, if you knew who it was that's in you, if you knew who it was, huh, you walk into your house today and take dominion by the power. You take dominion. You don't need no man. You don't need no man controlling. You need the power of God. You need the power of God. You don't need to wait. You become that spiritual woman. Right now, right now, right now. True worshipers. Do you love him? He's looking for us. Who is us? True worshipers. Those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Do you love him? Do you love him? He came looking for you this morning. I made mistakes. I'm nobody. I'm a dog. I'm, I'm nothing. It don't matter. He came looking for you. I don't even know what you're talking about, Pastor. I don't know much about church or religion. I, I don't even know why I'm here. I just came to this mountain to, to lift up Jesus. I don't care what you know. All I can tell you is the time is now. The time is now when the Father seeketh somebody just like us. Somebody who is willing to worship Him in spirit uh, and in truth, uh, with sincerity and honesty. Somebody in this place, hear me and hear me well. You need to reject your mountain. I don't care if you come from Jerusalem. You hear me in the Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't care if you come from Jerusalem or you come from false gods of Samaria. You need to reject uh, your religion. And you need to get a relationship with the one who came looking for you beside your well. Come on. I know he's looking for us. 